Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the weekly Q&A session. Uh, you ask your tech-related mountain bike questions about servicing and things like that, uh, or even about older bike parts you want to find out about. Get involved in the questions underneath there, uh, in the comments section even. Use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and fire away, basically. So first question this week is from Daniel Wilmot. I'm hopefully going to be getting a nuke-proof Scout 275 frame shortly and plan to run Horizon V2 rims front and rear. What width tyres would you recommend uh, running for trails here in the UK? I may also run a Cush Core in the rear. Uh, well, firstly, it sounds like a really nice bike and it's always good to be thinking about these sorts of things, but what you haven't really uh, included here is there is no right tyre size or tyre profile or tyre brand or anything for any one rider of this. It can be different for everyone. Now, I tend to run 2.4 in the front and around a 2.3 on the rear on my trail bike. And on my cross country bike between 235 and 225, depending on what option of tyre there is and for what time of year. Generally, I'll go for something a bit thinner in the winter and a bit wider in the summer, so I can basically just get the larger volume. It just feels a bit better on the firmer trails. Now, the tyre width was obviously going to depend on the way that you ride, where you ride, uh, the type of terrain available to you as well. So a very thin, lightweight tyre, for example, is not going to be much good if you ride very rocky terrain, perhaps like the Peak District, somewhere like that. You're going to need something with more cushioning and also something with a bit more sidewall support. And probably to reflect all of that, it's going to be a slightly more aggressive tyre. Uh, and therefore, the overall size of it is likely to be bigger, around a 2.4 for example. Um, there is no right or wrong with tyres, so you have to kind of figure out what works for you. Now the best suggestion we've always said is to find out what other riders that ride in the same spots are running on their bikes. Look at, there'll be a common sort of tyre of choice. It will seem to be like a really good tyre to use on the front wheel. Some riders will go for the same option on the front as they do on the rear. Other riders will choose a slightly faster rolling tyre on the rear, which is what I prefer. I'd rather sacrifice a little grip and have it roll that little bit quicker because I have to transition quite a lot to where I ride. And riding on big, super gnarly tyres is not that much fun to get there. And also, we've got the worst mud in the world here in Bath. We've got a combination of limestone rock and clay mud, which um, it almost doesn't matter what tyres you're running in the middle of winter because you're going to be slip sliding whatever happens. Okay, so uh, next question's from Steady Jim. I'm suffering for, with sticky pistons and rubbing on my SRAM Ultimate G2 brakes on my S-Works Levo SL. Man, you got seriously a nice bike there. Um, I remember in another video you mentioned you might be doing one about greasing the pistons. My bike shop's telling me the only way to solve it is to buy a new set of pistons for both brakes, but this doesn't seem completely right to me. Can you help? Um, okay, well Jim, Sorry, I've just not got around to making that video. If I'm completely honest, uh, things have just been crazy busy. And that's a video that takes a little bit of time, you know, taking a break off a bike and stripping it down stuff. However, you don't always need to completely strip them down to do that. Now your bike shop is partly right because it may be a problem with that particular caliper that you've not said or perhaps they've not uh, let you know about that can't be fixed. Um, but that said, it's definitely worth trying to service them yourself first and you're going to know if it's going to be a problem or not. So it's definitely worth trying. So depending uh, on what, what brakes you've got, this is the same for anyone. So you've got SRAM, so you'll need dot fluid for this or dot grease. Um, you should typically use the fluid that you have in your brakes to lubricate those pistons. So if it's mineral fluids, use mineral oil. And if it's dot fluids, use dot oil. Uh, I've seen some other people talk about using different types of greases. The only grease that I would dare put anywhere near brakes would be in the dot case. And I think I've got some here, hold on, uh, is dot grease. Um, yeah, I've got some here that's uh, been used so little over the years. As you can see, there is a, yeah, there's only one splodge being taken out of this. Uh, basically, this is safe to use on brake pistons on SRAM and Avid brakes. This is obviously marked as Avid, that's how old it is. So what you really need to do is you take your wheel out the bike, take the brake pads out of those brakes, then very carefully squeeze a lever to basically just push those pistons out. When the pistons are almost fully out, you don't want them to pop out completely. Just be cautious of this. Use some disc brake cleaner. Don't use anything stronger than that. Disc brake cleaner is safe to use around the seals on any brand of brake, so uh, do that carefully. Very carefully clean around the edges of the pistons. Now, provided they're not scratched or scuffed or anything, the only thing that will stop them operating smoothly is uh, maybe the seals themselves are damaged or perhaps if the actual piston itself has somehow um, it's got slightly bigger or it's distorted or something like that, which can be a problem on certain materials that have been used over the years, but you won't know until you try this. 
clean up the edges and then lubricate the sides of that piston uh, with the relevant oil, in your case some dot oil, or if you can be bothered, get some of that dot grease, but the oil will be absolutely fine. Uh, I should need to tell you to protect your bike from dot oil especially, um, and protect your gloves, uh, protect your hands by wearing a pair of gloves even, a um, pair of rubber nitrile gloves, something like that, to protect your hands from the oil because it is a little bit corrosive on your skin. Uh, once that's done, pretty much you want to push the pistons back in. Now avoid anything metallic or anything sharp to do this. The best bet really if you've got no specific tools is a tie lever, not a metal one obviously. Uh, just a nylon or a plastic tie lever because they're quite forgiving. Gently just seat them back into place and then clean the caliper up as best as you can. Now you might need to do a brake bleed at this point, sometimes you can't reset the pistons properly without doing a minor bleed. Obviously you've got to create room in the system and then you'll bleed it and then basically everything pulls itself back in line. Um, clean that caliper, make sure there's no oil in there, uh, certainly know where to get on your brake pads, refit your brake pads and give them a go basically and it should make them feel a little bit better at least. But if there's no help in them then yes there probably is a problem with your actual calipers. We've seen this over the years with all different brands. Uh, the caliper, sorry, the pistons within the caliper can be made of a softer material and as they wear, basically they can just get a bit sticky and just not work as they should do. Uh, so your bike shop will advise on the actual product number if it does need replacing, but definitely try try the little method yourself just to look after them. I will do this a video uh, at some point. I'm sorry, there's like there's literally a million videos to make all the time. Uh, it's pretty hectic here. I'd love to just be able to make all these all the time, but um, I'm not a robot, unfortunately. Um, hopefully that helps you anyway for the short term. Okay, so next question is from uh, Linativ. Um, hi Dolly, I've got a problem with my brakes. Uh, the Shimano BRM 200s with 180mm rotors front and rear. Now I'm actually on the heavy side, I'm 130 kilos. Okay, wow, yeah, you're quite a big guy. Um, I've already lost 15 kilograms since I started riding. Wow, dude, that is amazing. Congratulations on that, um, and way to go as well. So you'll probably end up losing more the more you ride. It's really good for your, good for your head as well as your body. Um, now on steep and technical descents, I have to brake as soon as I see a turn, otherwise I might go straight on. Yeah, all right, I feel your pain here. Do you think I can change just the calipers to four pots um, without changing the whole braking system? Thank you very much, and greetings from Italy. Okay, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest, on your ones, but with almost all Shimano stuff, it is cross-compatible. Um, you can typically do this. Now, there's a pair of brakes on screen, so the product number of these particular brakes is the MT420. That's a four-pot caliper, so I suspect that you could use these, but the real difference on all of the braking systems on Shimano is the hose and how the hose meets with the caliper at the end. Some have the banjo fitting, and so there's two different types, and some have a direct in that's a bit more like your brake lever end. Now, I'm gonna put a link, you can see on the screen, a little chart of compatibility options going past on screen. I'm gonna put a link to that in the description underneath. It's kind of helpful. It tells you which disc road to sizes, which, which pads, which calipers and levers and stuff are all cross compatible. Now, I'm almost certain, like I said, 99% sure, um, that you can do this. However, I'm not sure the cost will be to benefit, right? So, bearing in mind that uh, if you use those brake levers and you put a four port caliper on there, yes, you would definitely get a bit more power but the real way to get more power is with a better lever as well. A lever that's got servo wave technology and it's basically got a bit more of a mechanical advantage. The harder you pull the levers, the more power it gives you. So when you're really in need of power and you're really hauling on those brakes, it's gonna give you more back. So it might serve you better to get yourself a full set of brakes, but I think you can actually, um, you can do what you're asking to do here. Now, if you're going for a set of four piston brakes, the other things you also want to consider as well, full stop, are your disc rotor size. You say you've got 180s. I'm not sure that you, the bike you've got would be compatible with a bigger rotor, but you can get more power out of your existing calipers just by having a bigger disc rotor because it's got more leverage. However, more leverage is a great thing, but it also puts more strain on the caliper. So a single pot, uh, sorry, twin pot caliper that you've got could still overheat and you get fade and the brake won't be quite as good as it would be if it had an additional set of pistons. So being a four piston brake over a two. Um, also bear in mind the pad material. If you've got organic or resin pads, they can feel quite sharp initially and they can work quite well, but they once they heat up and you're really using them, they can fade a bit. Sintered metal pads are much better for this. They take a lot longer to bend in. They can be a bit noisy, they can squeak and stuff, um, but they're much more powerful. So if you've not got those, there might be a way to check those things first. It might save you a bit of money in the long run. Um, and like I said, you know, you've got the two piston and four piston options and then the different style levers. Now, if you do uh, want to upgrade your brakes, going to a four pot system. I'd probably be tempted to go for something like a deal with a four pot, which has got a better lever or even an SLX. 
Um, now you could always do one brake at a time if it's a costing issue to save a bit of money because you can buy Shimano's, you can buy the ind individual components, the levers and the calipers and the, and the hoses for them, but you can also buy complete sets as a single rather than a pair. Uh, so hopefully there's something there that will help you. But like I said, I'm almost certain that you can mix and match stuff. I'm just not sure that that's gonna get you the best results there. Uh, but good luck with that. I hope you make the right choice for you. Okay, next question is from Brian Flows. Does the move to extra slack head angles have any benefit for the average rider who doesn't live near an epic downhill course? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess, well, yes and no to being perfectly annoying to your question. Uh, yes, in the fact that when you're riding on faster or steeper and, and to a degree rougher terrain, a slack head angle is basically gonna calm the steering down. It's gonna make everything feel a bit slower, a bit more predictable. Yeah, so that's a really good thing. The downside is when you're climbing, even a, a slack head angle bike, you can still climb up the hill. It's not really gonna affect things. Uh, your steering can be a little bit harder to control over a steeper head angle bike, yeah? So you can wander around a bit. Uh, you can go offline and stuff. You can dial into this, you get used to it in time, like you can with, with any bike, but that is one of the downsides. But I do think the bigger downside is if you're getting and this is double-edged sword as well. So if you're getting an entry-level rider or a bit more of an amateur rider, riding a bike with very aggressive slack geometry, yeah, it's gonna be great and very confidence-inspiring because the fact it's gonna be a bit more stable and confidence-inspiring. But the downside is it can actually, you'll end up going a lot faster than perhaps you have the ability to control. And that opens a whole new can of worms because if you're an amateur rider and you don't know how to read the trail ahead, you don't know how to deal with last minute line choices, jumping over rocks, picking different lines, uh, you end up in a situation where you're going too fast to control the bike. That's a whole new lot of problems. I'm not hearing anyone talking about it. Everyone's like, oh yeah, just get a slack bike because it makes it like really good for confidence in spine. To a degree, um, you could say that riding a bike with steeper geometry will make you a better rider sooner because you have to tame the sort of slightly agile feeling bike. Now, I love an agile feeling bike. I love the feeling that you are in total control the whole time. You have to master that control. So to a degree, it will teach you a better form. And you could always, you could also say the same with riding a hardtail bike. It's not gonna teach you to be a better full suspension rider, but it will teach you things um, that you won't necessarily learn straight away on a full suspension bike. For example, the contact of your tires on the ground. Now, a full suspension bike, the job of suspension, other than being comfortable and absorbing shock, is to keep those tires on the ground, so it gives you loads of traction. But you need to understand the traction that you get from your tires onto, say, a wet route or wet rock or something like that. It's different, and you don't necessarily feel that with a suspension bike. On a hardtail, you're very much in tune with the terrain that's underneath your tires. So for that, method, uh, for that reason, really, I would always say to someone, try if you can, and learn your and refine your skills, all the basic stuff on a hardtail if you can before jumping up to a full suspension bike, because then you can apply that with whatever you do. Now, some people, I know Jones over at EMB and he hates hardtails and he will he will tell me I'm wrong to blue in the face. Like, no one is right, this is just what I think. And from my experience, riding bikes with perhaps less than ideal geometry, i.e. really short and steep geometry, and a hardtail will teach you, because you, there's nowhere to go with bad habits. You don't pick up bad habits, you have to ride really well. Whereas suspension bikes and slack angles, they can mask a lot of problems out on the trail. And to a degree, e-bikes can as well. We're now seeing a lot of riders coming into the sport that weren't possibly riders before, which is brilliant, because we want the sport to grow and be more accessible. But also, it's enabling people to get to places that they probably wouldn't have had the skill to get to previously, and perhaps at speeds, they can't necessarily control. So just throwing that one out there. It's a great thing because the bikes do handle better, but it can get you into trouble, I think. Um, what do you think? Do you like a slack angled bike? Do you prefer a twitchy, agile, more responsive bike? Do you agree with me that, you know, perhaps it's better to learn some of those fundamental skills on a more basic bike and then take them to a more advanced bike? or? Did you come into mountain biking straight on a full suspension and just crack on? Um, like I said, it's no right or wrong. Right? It's just some feelings that I've had from over the years. I'd love to know what you think. So let us know in those comments underneath. Uh, and thanks for commenting, by the way, everyone, each and every one of you, because it's always great stuff. And I love how you all support each other as well when we're not ourselves commenting on there. So that's super cool. There's not many YouTube channels that have this. Uh, next question is from Peter Kosis. What's the difference between a horizontal and a vertical rear shock? Um, Really, not a lot. Um, arguably, you could say that mounting a shock lower down, which 
vertical mount, basically lower down on the bike. Um, well, you can get horizontal mounts lower, but mounting a shock lower on the bike could be a better thing because you're putting weight lower down, especially so if it's a bigger shock or a coil spring shock because they are notably heavier than a super lightweight air sprung shock, for example. Now, you've got to think that when a frame manufacturer is designing a bike, they're not designing it to have a high shock, a low shock, a all of these things you know they're they're looking at the overall package so for example uh, someone designing a bike design for cross country or bike packing one of the things they're going to be looking for is space in that front triangle in order to fit as much in the way of water bottles or bike packing gear as possible so they will try and have a suspension design that accounts for that yeah and of course there's loads of different suspension designs on the back and a shock ending up where it is some people will put the shock in a place where it it's irrelevant where it is in the front triangle. It's all about making the rear end feel as good as possible. And other bike manufacturers will have to sacrifice that in order to give you the space for the water bottles and the other things on the front triangle. Um, there really is no sort of major significant advantage. There was a time where everyone said, oh, you need to get your shocks down as low as possible, but really an air shock doesn't weigh that much. Of course, all the hardware driving it can weigh stuff, but it's all a compromise, as we know. You know, you have to fit a water bottle in there if you want to ride with that pack. Um, but arguably some bike manufacturers will say, well, you shouldn't be thinking about where a water bottle, water bottle is going. You should only consider the rear suspension. Mm, yes and no. Uh, for a downhill bike, of course, because it's all about the actual performance of the rear suspension sticking the bike to the floor and absorbing shock. Nothing else counts. Well, let's face it, all other mountain bikes, we've still got riding places, still got carry things. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going with that. Um, next up is from Downamex. Doddy, what are your thoughts on data acquisition? Interesting, in mountain biking, and do you think it's a trendy fad or a vital tool for the competitive rider? Um, well, from my perspective, it's incredibly interesting and something I've never had any time on, really. Um, I've seen lots of different data, data acquisition software stuff. I've seen lots of different physical kits out there, but never tried any. And, and actually, I would love to, I think there's probably a really cool video in it, or actually just an experiment just to, for myself. I'd like to know if I could go to a course, set up a bike how I think I could ride it well, uh, do some runs on it perhaps, and then you know, actually see with the data acquisition equipment if it could be improved and what would actually be improved. Um, for racing, um, yeah, un undoubtedly racers will be able to get an advantage by having data acquisition equipment. Of course, suspension designers will use this to develop the pivot points on the bike and the shock and you know, all that sort of stuff. But for getting the most out of the bike, racers 100% could get an advantage out of this. But the way to do it is, is really quite uh, important. So. It takes the element out of the rider really knowing the bike out of it because you're getting data acquisition to tell you things, but a rider still needs to understand what the bike is doing um, in order to you know, report back this stuff. So you need a, you need a course that you could do repeat runs on uh, in a fairly consistently close time. It doesn't have to be like, you know, hundreds of tenths of a second, but you need to be, you know, fairly consistently if you're running at say 80%, you need to be able to do that sort of ballpark time in order for you really to make comparison before and after that sort of stuff. Now, you've, all, you've got to bear in mind as well that you or I might set up a bike to feel really nice and to feel great and maybe poppy and supportive and to feel nice when you jump it off stuff. Racers, are only looking for the bike that will enable them to go as fast as possible. And quite often, when you get on like a legit race bike from a pro rider, they quite often feel horrible. You know, some people like the forks immensely hard, the rear end soft, you know, they're all over the place. And it's got to work for that style of rider. That's why that data acquisition testing comes in. Um, I think it's a whole minefield of information. I can't believe we've never actually looked into it more, to be honest. Um, I can't really go anywhere than that because I've not ridden this stuff. Um, I would love to. I'd love to have a feel. Bear in mind, a bike that feels good in a car park, it's not necessarily going to be an EWS winning bike. You know, like I just said, the bikes that are fast always don't feel quite right, but you get them up to speed, suddenly it makes sense. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a tool for competitive riders, uh, but only when used properly. Uh, probably not that much of a tool for you and I because the base settings that most manufacturers give you, they're genuinely really good these days. You know, five or six years ago, they were pretty vague, but now they're they're almost bang on, I think, for a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, next question is from Matar177. Dolly, have you got any suggestions for chainstay protection on a bike that has the gear cable rooted ooh, along the top of the chainstay? Uh, also, is there any likelihood of the gear cable being damaged by the chain when rooted in this way? Um, all right, so in reverse, no, I wouldn't have thought you were gonna get any damaged. Uh, gear cables are pretty hardy, but that is quite annoying, yeah. Um, 
You see it quite a lot on the underside, not so much on the top though. Huh. I guess the best option really, if you're willing to do it, would be to um, drill out the cable stops um, because you'll have a piece of outer cable that goes from the derailleur to a stop on the top of the chainstay. It'll be bare cable across the top of the chainstay. There'll, there'll be another stop somewhere. Um, you could drill those out and you could run a, a constant length of outer cable all the way to the handlebars. And by doing that, then you can, you've got the outer sheath protecting that cable, but it also enables you to wrap something over the top of the lot, like some of that 3M rubber mastic tape, like this stuff that I love using, uh, Scotch M2228. Uh, it's really quite hard to get sometimes, so it might just be in a moment because of uh, pandemics and supply chains and stuff, but it's essentially a rubber mastic tape that sticks amazingly, and because it's thick rubber stuff, it's quite damping the qualities to it. It looks really neat and tidy. Um, alternatively, you could, if you didn't want to drill out your frame to do it, you could still run at a constant length and you could probably use some of that tape to hold it in place on that chainstay. Uh, you might want to run a cable tie at each end just to be sure, but I think that's probably the best option for you. Um, anyone else had an issue like that out there? I've not seen a bike, I'm just looking around on bikes I've got here. I've not seen a bike with a cable roots on top of the chainstay for many years. So no, sorry, I can't really help you with that. Um, but that's it for this week's show. Um, some pretty good questions there. Actually, it's quite interesting stuff, especially I think the one about the data acquisition. Interesting. Hopefully, when we can start traveling more, we might get access to go and see you know, some teams in the off-season. Now we're getting to the off-season, sadly, already, um, to see how they test. Uh, that would be a really cool feature, I think. I'd love to know a bit more about that. Hey, if you run them out by team and you do exactly that, let us know. Maybe we'll come and see you. That'd be awesome. Uh, thanks, as always. Get your questions in underneath there, and uh, we'll see you in the next show. See ya.